Okay, thank you, Torin. Appreciate it. Okay, I'd like to read from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 4 today. And uh, just make a few observations. Uh, this is fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. It says, Then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he'd fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now in this little passage, it describes Jesus being tempted by the devil. And I just want to make a few little observations. First of all, um, I don't think it took place like we see in pictures sometimes or in movies the way it's portrayed. Where, uh, I don't think Jesus saw the devil in a bodily form. You know, we see that in pictures sometimes. The devil's all dressed in black maybe and uh, some kind of a dark figure like that. I think uh, Jesus, when it says Jesus was tempted by the devil, I think his experience was just exactly like ours. He uh, heard a voice speaking to his mind. Thoughts came into his head. Thoughts came into his mind. The reason I say that is because, number one, we are told that Jesus uh, came in flesh uh, just like ours. In fact, Paul says he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, which is just a way of saying he had a body just like ours. Keep in mind, Jesus was mortal while, uh, before his resurrection. That just means subject to death. He had a body that could be killed, and it was. He was put to death. He's, he was in a, an ordinary body just like you and me. His perceptions, physical perceptions, were just like ours. Here's my third reason. Uh, the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points like, like as we are. Now, I trust that you've never seen the devil come walking up to you in a dark suit or a red suit or any other kind of suit. We don't, it's, that's not our experience. So if the Bible says Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, that means he experienced the same kind of experiences we do. I'm, I'm convinced that this, what we just read here, was a, an episode that took place. Uh, these thoughts came to his mind, and he rightly attributed them to the devil. Um, now here's the thing I want to observe about this. If you notice, everything the devil said to him, and, and I believe these are in the form of thoughts that passed through his mind, each one began with if. They all started with if. Uh, number one, they're designed to engender doubt, uh, to cause confusion or doubt. That's one thing. And this is the more important point. This is the, Torrin, could you give me for a second um, verse 6? I want you to notice, I really want to attract your attention. I think this is the most important point I want to get from this passage. The, yeah, verse 6 is what I want here. And um, in this same chapter, I'll just read it here to you. Yeah, and he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. The devil quoted the Bible to him. Now, how about that for playing dirty? <laughs> He quoted the scripture, didn't he? He said, it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Now, we can rest assured that even though the devil quoted the scriptures to him, he's misapplying what the intent was. Uh, I think we can take that for granted. 
But I just want to call to your attention that the devil knows what's in the Bible. That comes as a shock sometimes when we consider that, but not only that, I want to tell you that he not only knows the contents of the Bible, but he knows it better than you do. He knows what's in this Bible. And I might, uh, you know, I suppose uh, he's, uh, it causes him some uh, I, trepidation and anxiety, but he's not shy at all about using the Bible against you. He used it against Jesus, didn't he? He did, didn't he? He quoted, he came to him and quoted the Bible to him with the intent of engendering doubt. If, if thou be the Son of God. Now, I take from that that if he was not afraid to use the Bible against Jesus to engender doubt or other kinds of negative, you know, responses, I would say he's probably not afraid to use the Bible against you and me. And in the same way, he misapplies it. Now, I just want, to, want you to notice that each one of these temptations started with if, there's doubt involved, uh, there's, uh, uh, he's, he's tempting Jesus to doubt and to cast doubt upon his relationship with God. Let me look at another passage here and we can draw another conclusion. This is in way back at the end of the Bible in Revelation chapter 12. And um, I'm always kind of reluctant to read from the book of Revelation because it's such a uh, uh, controversial uh, book. Lots of people have different, you know, different ideas about it, but I just want to get a little narrow point from it here. This is in chapter 12 of Revelation. And uh, I'm going to start with verse um, 9, I think. Verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out. This is Revelation 12, 9. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent. You see, in the Garden of Eden, he was called a serpent. And by the Revelation, he is, now he's a dragon. But it's the same entity, the same person, the devil. The great dragon was cast out. By the way, uh, in case you're wondering, I don't believe what we're reading here is some future tense events. Not everything in the book of Revelation is meant to be future tense. We read it, we think of it that way. Right in the very beginning of Revelation, uh, it's, uh, the text says that John is going to see things which are and which were and which are yet to be. So there's the whole scope of time. I believe this is describing something that took place uh, at the crucifixion of Jesus. Because Jesus, when he went to the cross in John chapter 12, just before he went, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Framing uh, his crucifixion and dying as a sacrifice for our sins as an event that would cause the prince of this world, or Satan, to be cast out. Cast out of heaven, that is. That's what it's describing here. So I believe this is describing that. But let's just get the details here about it. Um, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Deceiving means lies or deception, isn't that right? And he was cast out into the earth. In case you're wondering, that's here. <laughs> that's where we live. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Uh, by the way, just food for thought, when you read uh, in the Old Testament certain passages, like in the book of Job, you can find in chapter 1 of Job that uh, uh, what the text calls the sons of God came and appeared before God, and Satan came with them. And, they, and Satan got in a big argument with God concerning Job and brought accusations against him. Said the only reason he's prospering is because you're protecting him. And they got in this big fuss. And then Job went through a lot of trouble because of that. Now sometimes well-meaning, you know, individuals, Christians or whoever, read the book of Job and think, well, that's what's happening in my life. Satan's up there, you know, up there arguing with God and they're having some kind of a disagreement and that's why things are going bad in my life. No, he can't get up there anymore. He's been cast out. He doesn't have God's ear anymore. This text is describing what took place by virtue of the death of Jesus on the cross that purged our sins. He has no access anymore. He's cast out into the earth. And since he can't talk to God anymore, 
He's only got one set of people to talk to. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's you and me. Yeah. He can't get God's ear anymore. And I think that's good. That's a positive thing. He's cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation. See, this is one reason I think this is describing what took place by virtue of the cross, because that's what brought salvation to us. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. See, I believe all those things came into being by virtue of his death and resurrection. The power of his Christ. Listen, this is what I wanted to get to. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Just like I told you about Job. You notice that the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. He brings accusation. He's like the prosecutor. You know, that's what the prosecutor does in a criminal trial. He brings the accusations. Jesus, on the other hand, he's the advocate. John tells us that we have an advocate. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is on our side. He's not the accuser. Satan is the accuser. Now, since he can't bring accusations before God anymore, he's down here on the earth. I think the point is that he brings accusation to you and me. Let's get the next verse. Verse 11. This is, and when it says they, that means the brethren. That means you and me. Listen to this now. And they overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Now listen, when it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, that doesn't mean that you that you overcome the devil just by saying those words. It's not like a magic spell. You know, it's not by just saying blood of Jesus. Although I'm sure that doesn't hurt anything. But what he means is the blood of the lamb means his death on the cross. Isn't that right? Where he died a sacrificial death as the sacrificial offering. That means his death on the cross. We overcome any accusations brought by Satan or anything that comes that way uh, by Number one, what he did on the cross for us. Number two, it says the word of their testimony. That means that we understand that uh, it applies to us. In other words, it's not just some abstract idea. It, it applies to me. Now, let me try to make it practical for you. Here's how Apostle Paul said it uh, in Galatians chapter 2. You don't need to turn to this, Torin. I'm just going to quote it. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying, uh, the, my faith is focused on one thing, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's like saying the blood of the Lamb. He said he gave himself for me. And Paul says, he makes it personal, he says, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith. That is to say, I put my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's just a, another way of saying he's applying what Jesus did in his death. And I'll tell you what, you know, you might feel a little trepidation about this because Jesus probably, uh, he could go head to head with, or toe to toe, or whatever the expression is, with the devil concerning the, the Bible. You and me probably can't do that, but here, here's the good news. You don't need to know every scripture that's in the Bible. All you need to know is one simple truth. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah. Any accusation that the devil brings, anything he brings to your mind, all you've got to have for an answer is what the Apostle Paul used in Galatians 2.20. Jesus loves me, and he gave himself for me. Right here in this book of Revelation, let me show you something. Torn, could you go back to chapter 1? Look at what the author says. John. I say the author, you know, uh, we don't know for a fact that this is the same John that wrote John's gospel. But John, this author of Revelation, says... Uh, Chapter 1. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. That's why I can't see it. Uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 5. He's giving his greetings to those to whom he's writing, the seven churches. He says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, literally loves us, present tense, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, he loves us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's what Paul says, the way I live my life in the flesh is by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. 
John here says it's the same. That's the fundamental truth. That's really the only truth you need to know. If you want to say it differently, think of John 3, 16. Everybody knows that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. Now here's the point. That is the foundation of your security where God is concerned. I think, just my opinion, I think your sense of security is the most important thing in your Christian life. Your knowledge and sense of your own security. Now, I, I've never understood why some parts of the Christian community get upset about that and get scared and get nervous about that. Don't, don't make people feel secure. I, you know, some people are like that. But I think you've got to. See, you've got to know that you're secure. That's the very thing that the devil tries to attack. Uh, that's the nature of those temptations that he brought to Jesus. Now, here's, here's what I want. All that is an introduction. Here's the point. Let's just draw these conclusions. The devil is not afraid to use the Bible against you. But you don't have to know everything there is in the Bible. All you need to know is one central truth. Jesus loves me and he gave himself for me. Like it says in John 3.16, like it says in this verse, like Paul said in Galatians 2.20, Jesus loves me and gave himself for me. That's what it means by they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. He gave himself for me. And the word of their testimony, that is, it applies to me. Jesus loves me and he gave himself for me. Now, what I wanted to do today, and I'm a little bit, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about this, but then on the other hand, I'm not. Uh, I think you need to know. Um, the, I want to give you... Uh, prepare you and maybe inoculate you if I can say it this way I get with uh, a couple of favorite passages the devil likes to use to condemn Christians now again don't be surprised when I say that he likes to use the Bible against Christians he likes to make you feel secure uh, or insecure uh, by using Bible passages against you before I start I just want to give you one fundamental this is the source of most of the confusion um, look in John chapter 1. I just want to get a little central tr uh, truth here. John's Gospel chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading with uh, verse 10. Now here's why I'm telling you this. Just because, uh, in the same way that the devil misapplied Scripture to Jesus. He said it is written, and then he gave him a quotation, but it was an, a misapplication of that verse. He tries to do that with Christians. Let's just get one little fundamental truth, because this is the source of most of the misapplication. Verse 10, John's Gospel, verse 10. John says, He, Jesus, was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. Listen, verse 11. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Now just pause for a minute there and ponder this. It says that Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. When it says he came to his own, he doesn't mean Christians. There aren't any yet. But there were people of God under the Old Covenant, the nation of Israel, the first century nation of Israel, the people he's talking to in all the Gospels. Who is he talking to in the Gospels? He's talking to people in first century Israel. They were his own. They were the people of God in the Old Covenant. They should, he was their Messiah. They should have, he came to them, they should have received him. But it says, he came to his own, and his own received him not. Now that's a sad fact, but you can find that by reading the Gospels too. Only a few believed in him. Most rejected him. And he has some pretty tough things to say about those who didn't believe in him. They should have. All the signs were there. And he, he chastises them constantly. And here's what I want to say. Many of the things that the passages in the Gospels that the devil likes to use to condemn Christians are actually passages in which Jesus is chastising first century Israelites for not believing in him. They don't apply to Christians. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Now, he says, he came to his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them he gave the power, literally the privilege, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 
Now we're talking about Christians. You're talking about you and me. We are those who received him. Isn't that right? We are those who believe in him. We believe in his name. As many, that means everyone, as many as received him, to them he gave the power, literally the privilege, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. See, now keep this distinction in your mind. You and me as Christians are those who received him. Uh, in the Gospels, there are people who did not receive him. That's what he said in verse 11. Now, having laid that as a little foundation, let me just show you some of these passages. And I'm going to give you some passages that I know for a fact. See, it's, it's bad enough that the devil comes and brings accusation against us. What's worse than that is that human spokesmen take those ideas and use them, use the idea, the accusations of the devil against Christians. This is in, uh, this first one is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. And I just want you to put your thinking caps on here and, and think with me. I want to arm you against any accusation that, you see, you might come across this reading by yourself. Did you know when you read the Bible, the devil reads with you? For the purpose of saying, or engendering doubt. For the purpose of accusing. Now here's one. And I know, well, I, sh you know, I don't want to, like, I'm pointing fingers at anybody, but I know that this sometimes is used against Christians. Um, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, right away when I read that, the devil will jump on your shoulder and say, see, that's you. You think you're a Christian? Well, just don't be so sure. See, that's how he talks. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in, that, in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now let's just stop there for a second. That passage makes some Christians scared. And sometimes they're encouraged to feel scared. <laughs> I told you that I think the most important thing about your Christian life to hold on to or to know is that you're secure. And I don't know why some parts of the Christian world think that's a bad thing. And this is a tool used by some to make Christians feel insecure. And uh, you see, if you read something like that, the devil will jump up and say, you see, uh, you think you're secure, you think you're saved. Well, maybe not. Maybe, you know, engender doubt and fear. Let's just take a look at what he's saying here. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, verse 21, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, you see, if this passage is going to be used to accuse you, you'll just gloss right over that. But let's just stop for a minute. Let's just put on the brakes here and just consider what he's saying. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, don't gloss over that. Let's just analyze what, is, what does it mean to do the will of your Father which is in heaven. Did you know that uh, there are passages where Jesus tells you explicitly, explicitly what the will of God is, uh, this is in John's Gospel. Torrin, could you give me this? John's Gospel chapter, let's see, I made a little note of this. Uh, 6, verse 37. John's Gospel chapter 6, verse 37. Now, don't think you just automatically know what the will of God is. I, let's just let Jesus tell us. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father that is in heaven. Verse 37, John 6, 37. Thank you, Torn. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me, come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Now before going on, that's a good one to hold on to. If you've come to him, he says, under no circumstance will I cast you out. Now that's a, that's a, good, that's a good truth. But let's, we're here to find out what the will of God is. Verse 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Remember why we're reading this. He said, not 
everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of him that sent me. Well, that's what he's talking about here. He says, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Verse 39. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me. You see how explicit this is? And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. That's his will. But she raised it up at the last day. He just got through saying, everyone that comes to me, uh, I will in no wise cast out. So he says, first of all, here's God's will, that of all those he's given me, I should lose none. Raise it up again at the last day. Verse 40. This is what applies to us. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He says, this is the will of God, that everyone that sees Jesus, and by that doesn't mean you see him with your physical eyes, but you perceive Jesus and you believe in him. Does that apply to you and me? Yes, it does. That's the, see, we are those who have done the will of God because we believed in him. Go back to Matthew again. Verse 21. Chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, that's you and me because we believed in him. Evidently, he's talking about people in his own day, people that were following him around and just saying what everybody else was saying, I guess, and, and just giving lip service, but didn't really believe in him. This is, Ma I'm sorry, Torn, Matthew 7, uh, 21. I'm jumping around a little bit. 22, sorry. No, 21, that's what it was. Many will, sorry, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. You see, there were people in the Gospels who Jesus commissioned to go out and act in his name who did all those things. He's saying just because you did all those things, that's not what it's really about. It's about believing in him. That's the will of God, that you believe in him. He's not, he's not talking at all to Christians. He's talking to people who were standing in his very presence saying, listen, the thing that you've got to do, it's not about casting out devils. It's not about, prof it's not about big showy things. It's about one thing. It's putting your faith in him, believing in him. And see, he's trying to jar them into reality that, you know, get down to the real core of this. He's not talking to you and me. It doesn't apply to you and me. Verse 23, and I will profess unto them, I never knew you. That scares Christians. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That scares Christians. I know it does. But he's not talking to Christians. He's talking to people that are standing in his presence who are not believing in him, but are just kind of going along with the crowd. Now, he says, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Let's just put on the brakes and just examine something here. Um, Torn, would you give me for a second um, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. He's talking about the Old Testament. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. He's talking about those same people who Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. Um, this is the covenant, verse 10. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Listen to this in verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. He's saying in this new covenant that we're a part of, we all know him. So he evidently, back there in the gospel that we were reading, was not talking to Christians because he says those that are in the new covenant, they all know him. Isn't that right? They all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. When he said, all shall know me, who then could he be talking about back there when he said, depart from me, I never knew you? Well, whoever didn't enter into this covenant, evidently, 
Whoever, you know, the Last Supper, he took the cup and he said, This is my blood of the new covenant. And to him who loved us and washed us in his own blood. I guess, you know, uh, for people who, whoever he's talking about that didn't know him, that's people who didn't enter in by putting their faith in his, his sacrifice. Uh, there's one more about that I want to give you because uh, this kind of helps kind of clinch the deal. This is first, uh, first Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I think that's it. It might be 2 Timothy. Let me turn and see that. Uh, first Tim let's try 1 Timothy 1, 12 first. I wrote that down, but I've, now that I see that, I think I, I meant 2 Timothy. Um, Sorry here. This is really inefficient, you know, having to turn all these pages. Um, oh, tw 2 Timothy. Sorry, Torn. It would help if I tell you the right one. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Yes. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know him in whom I have believed. Now, when Jesus, back in the gospel, said, depart from me, I never knew you, evidently he's talking about people that don't believe in him. Is that a fair conclusion to draw? So if you're reading that passage and a thought comes to your mind saying, see, you think you're saved, but he says, he, he, he'll probably say to you one day, depart from me, I never knew you. You should turn around and say, devil, you're a liar. <laughs> I, I, see, all, listen, all you've got to say is, Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. <laughs> I believe in him. I've done the will of God. That's what Jesus said, because I believe in him. So he's not talking to me there, is he? No. He's talking to people who are standing around, going along with the crowd, but not believing in him. He's doing things that look good, sounded good. He says, you know, check up on your, on your heart. Check up on what's your real reason for doing this. He's trying to jar those people he came to his own, and his own received him not. He knew that. He's trying to jar them into... See, he loved them. He wanted them to, to enter into this new covenant. He's trying to jar them out of their complacency. He is not talking to Christians. But see, the, the devil hopes you won't know that. And when you read that passage, he'll try to accuse you with it. He'll try to use that as a tool, as a club to beat you over the head. Uh, but don't let him do it. Uh, here's another one. This is right here. I know I'm jumping around a lot. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. I know for a fact that this one bugs some Christians. I'm trying to uh, disarm these tools, uh, disarm the devil. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. See, when you start to see the right perspective on these things, then it, uh, it becomes a lot more clear. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lie at home, at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion, notice by the way how, how gracious and free Jesus is with healing. He doesn't say, well, maybe it's God's will that he be sick. He says, no, he's sick, I'll come and heal him. Problem solved. He knew why he was there. We should know that too. Uh, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Why did he say that? Because this man is a Gentile. This man is an outsider. This man is a Roman, a Roman centurion. He's not part of the old covenant people of God. He's, not, he's an outsider. He's a Gentile. And yet he comes and believes in Jesus. And Jesus says, I haven't found faith like this. May I paraphrase? I haven't found faith like this in the people who should have it. <laughs> He came to his own, and his own received him not. Now that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, this man has tremendous faith in me, why don't you? Meaning those in the nation of Israel who were not believing in him. Do you get that? Now, if you understand that, you'll understand what he says next. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham, with Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. By the way, 
What does he mean? Same thing he said when he said in that previous verse, this Gentile is believing in me. He says, there will be many that come from the east and the west. That means from all different points of the compass, outsiders in other words. And they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But verse 12 says, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now I know that this little verse here troubles some Christians, because they immediately forget everything that happened in the previous verses, and they think, uh-oh, the, the children of the kingdom, that's me. No, it's not you. He doesn't mean you. See, the devil's right there saying, you better be afraid. You might get cast into outer darkness. No, he doesn't mean, he, by the children of the kingdom, he means that these, uh, these people in the nation, he came unto his own and his own received him, not the children of Israel who didn't believe in him. Those are the children of the kingdom that he's talking about here. Those to whom the kingdom rightly should have belonged but don't believe. He says, they're going to be in outer darkness. Now, by the way, see, we read this in a sloppy way sometimes, in an in a imprecise way. We think we know what he's saying, and we jump to conclusions. He doesn't say they're going to go to hell. He said they'll be in outer darkness. If you read the Bible, Gentiles are described as those who sit outside in darkness. He's saying they're going to, these people that should be believing in me or not believing in me, they're going to end up on the outside where the Gentiles were, but the Gentiles who are believing in me, they're going to come from the east and the west. They're going to be on the inside. He's trying to shame those of his own who did not believe in him. He's trying to jar them and say, look, folks, this guy believes in me and he's a Roman. Why aren't you believing in me? I haven't found faith like this in Israel. Uh, that ought to be clear from the context. Don't let the devil use this against you or a Christian. This is not applying to Christians. Uh, no Christian uh, does this apply to. He's talking about those in, in, in that first century nation of Israel. And by the way, I, I guess I should be explicit about this. I'm talking about first century nation of Israel. This is not a message that's anti-Jews. It's not talking about Jews alive today who are just like everybody else. They should believe in Jesus just like everybody else should. Um, let's look at one more, and this will become even more clear. I think after what we read, I know because um, I know this is a passage that alarms some people, and I don't want anybody to be alarmed. I think with what we've just read, you'll understand this. By the way, let me just emphasize again. No Christian is going to be rejected by him. Didn't Jesus just say that in John chapter 6? Torrent had it up on the screen there. He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Yeah, he did say that. No Christian will be rejected by him. He's talking about people in his day who didn't believe in him. What's the will of God that we believe in him? If they didn't do that, they haven't done the will of God. He's trying to shake them up. He's not applying... See, don't let the, any thought come to your mind uh, that brings accusation against you using these kinds of verses. Uh, this is Luke chapter 13, verse 23. I know from talking to people that this troubles some people. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then you shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and the west and the north and the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there, uh, there are last which shall be first, and first which shall be last. Now, according to what we just read earlier, I think you can now see, perhaps, uh, a little more clearly, what the context is here. This is the exact thing he said applying to the fact that that Roman centurion believed in him, but those uh, Jewish Israelites of the first century who didn't believe in him, who should have, 
That's who he's uh, warning against here. Uh, but let's just go back to the beginning of this. See, this troubles some people. Verse 23, it creates, the devil uses this to create insecurity in the minds of Christians who haven't thought it through. Verse 23, let's just take this first. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? See, I've even had conversations. I'm, this is how I know this bothers people, with people who say, see, only a few are going to make it. Only a few will be saved. Is that really what he's saying? No. Torin, uh, I'm going to make you work today. Make you earn your money. As though there were money involved here. <laughs> Torrent, would you... Uh, let's see, I, I made a note of this. It's uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. I just want you to notice something. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Great, thank you. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. They're talking about Jesus. You notice how often the, the death of Jesus is referenced as a very important fact this is what redeems us. This is what washed us from our sins. This is what makes us right with God. And it's, it's a shame that there were people who didn't believe in Jesus and enter into this relationship based on the blood of Jesus. Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Listen, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That sounds like what he said from the north and the south and the east and the west. Your blood has redeemed us out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation and has made us, verse 10, unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels, and I've got to turn the page, round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was a few. No. Did I read that wrong? And there were only a few that were saved. Is that what it says? No. It doesn't say that. Yeah. Does it say only a few were saved? Only a few made it? Just a real narrow few? No. He's talking about people who were redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Christians, in other words. Who came from all directions, just like the centurion, who had nothing more in their credit except they believed in him and put their faith in him. In which Jesus says, you know, in Israel, I haven't found this kind of faith. These people from the north, south, east, and west, they believe in me, redeemed to God, and here they are praising Jesus, the lamb that was slain. Listen, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a few, does it? Now, don't get hung up on the math here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start calculating this. In, ancient, in the ancient world, this is a, a figure of speech that means an innumerable number. That means an infinite, an uncountable number. When he says 10,000 upon 10,000 and thousands of thousands, that's just like saying a number that's so big you can't count it. That's how, that's how many are saved. Not a few. Now, but what then does a few uh, apply to? Let's go back again, Torn, Luke chapter 13, verse 23. Then said unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Well, let me tell you where a few comes into play. Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not, except for a few. A few did believe in him, like his 12 disciples and a few others. He's talking about those people that are standing there in the nation of Israel, to whom he came, most of them rejected him, but only a few believed. That's who he's referring to here. And he says, verse 24, to all those people standing around there, to get their attention, what's the bottom line? To believe in him. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and, not, and be not able. The straight gate means it's pretty straight. You gotta, it's just one thing. It's pretty narrow in the sense that it's just about believing in Jesus. When once the master of the house has risen up and hath shut the door, and you begin to stand without and knock and say, Lord, Lord, open to us. Do um, you know what he's implying here? He's implying that there's going to come a time when you're going to recognize that I am who I said I was. But then it's going to be too late. Now, 
these people that he's talking to, this is going on in about, around about 30, 31, 32 AD. That's when Jesus' ministry was taking place. In 40 years, in 70 AD, within one generation, the Roman army came and they killed everybody they could find. They leveled the cities, they burned the town, they destroyed the temple, they slaughtered thousands of Jews. They discovered then that Jesus really was who he said he was because he predicted that. And he's saying here, he's saying, don't wait till it's too late. He's, you know, using metaphoric language, saying to them, not to Christians, not to us. He's saying to them, he says, you're going to come to realize that, that everything I'm telling you now is true, but then it's going to be too late. Look at verse 26. If you want to know for sure who he's talking about, he says, then you shall begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Well, I don't know about you, but I've never eaten and drunk in his presence. He's never taught in our streets. Has he? No. But he taught in their streets. He sat down and ate with them. And because they didn't believe in him, he's, see, he's trying to jar them. He's trying to shake them. He's, it's like metaphorically grab somebody by the shoulders and say, listen, folks, I came to you and you're not believing in me. He said, they're going to come from all directions. That's what he says next. But I say to you and I tell you, uh, I know you not whence you are. He's not talking to Christians. You know, Paul already said, I know him in whom I believed. These, this is the, the nature of the new covenant. They'll all know me from the least to the greatest. He's talking about those people in first century Israel that didn't believe in him. Verse 28, then shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see. By see, he means you're going to realize that all of these Gentiles that believed in me, they're all on the inside. With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the people that you revere, and the prophets, and they're all part of the kingdom of God, and you missed it. You missed out on it. Verse 29 says, They shall come from the east and the west, and the north and the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are a last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. What does that mean? He says that a lot. That means these people that you're despising, these Gentiles, they're going to end up being in the front of the line. And you who think you're privileged and know all about it, you're going to be, there's going to be a role reversal. And it's all based on just one thing, because you didn't believe. Now, I just got through saying to you, uh, in a passage like this, I hope by explaining it and going through it, you see that it doesn't apply to Christians. Although the devil would like to scare Christians with it. And those, who, those human spokesmen for him <laughs> who like to use this as a club to beat up Christians. Uh, any th let me just make it simple. Any thought, any Bible passage that g engenders in you fear, doubt, uh, anxiety, apprehension, that doesn't come from heaven. That comes from the devil. And you need to have one simple answer to it. I put my faith in Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. That's all. That's all you need to say. And if this seems contradictory to that, then this must be talking about somebody else. Because I know I've put my faith in him. He loved me and he gave himself for me. That's all I know. That's all I need to know. And any passage like this, evidently he's talking to somebody else. And I just went through this to show you that, yes, there are others that he's talking to. Um, let's end on a positive note. Torn, uh, give me Romans chapter 8. Let's end on, on an upbeat uh, note here. Romans chapter 8, um, verse 35. Paul likes to sum things up in this kind of way by putting emphasis where it belongs. Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us? This is Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep for slaughter. See, he's doing the same. He's quoting a Bible passage here. But then he says, verse 37, No. In other words, that does not apply to us. No, he says. You notice that? Nay. Of course, we don't say nay, unless you've got a horse. Um, that's horse talk. <laughs> nay, that just means no. <laughs> no, he says. <laughs> How can he... By the way, Torn, look at verse 36 again. Go back one verse. I'm trying to end here, but... As it is written... He's quoting the Bible here. He says, as is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted sheep for the slaughter. And now the next verse, Torn. 
nay. How can he quote the Bible and say no? Because he's quoting a passage and he's saying, no, this does not apply to us. Did you get that? He's saying, yeah, you might be thinking this. This might be the thought that's going through your mind. But let me tell you something. This does not apply to us. In all these things, on the contrary, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not because we're perfect, not because we've done everything right, but because of him that loved us. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You, as an individual, are meant by God to be more than a conqueror through him that loved you. And that's his intent for you. Verse 38. Listen to this. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities. That's his language for demons. Angels or demons. Nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now it sounds to me like... Uh, God's love is the thing that holds us firm and secure. And what he's saying is, focus your attention on that and just hold on to that and don't let anything come between it. Because God's love is never going to change. And all those things that we read that sound kind of threatening, he must be talking to somebody else. And I hope I've explained to you that there was somebody else that he was actually talking to. Okay, I think that's all I got. Let's all stand up today. I thank God that he's on our side.